You looking at me? I'm looking at you. <laughs> looking no, at I'm looking at the camera. Okay, right. I'm waiting for you to give me the L note. And <laughs> action in five, four, three. Two, one. <laughs> yes, two, one. Here we go, folks. This is number 500. That's a lot of quick tips. So we thought we'd do something a little different for this one. Got Roger here. We, we, we went back through your comments and pulled some uh, that we thought could be answered verbally rather than with a demonstration. So Roger's going to ask the questions and I'm going to do the answers. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. We have some questions here from subscribers and viewers. And question number one, this person writes, I paint with acrylics and apply your lessons to that media. They seem to translate well, but do you ever paint with acrylics? I'm too old to wait <laughs> for oil to dry. Too LOL. old to wait for oil to dry. <laughs> okay. The short answer of that is I rarely paint with acrylics. I don't ever do a real painting or a complete painting with acrylics anymore. Um, and really the reason for that is that in the demonstrations when I'm teaching, oils is a much better medium because it doesn't do that fast drying that we know that acrylics do. However, the way I teach, if you will notice, I'm teaching you principles and I'm teaching you techniques that can be used with oils and acrylics. So they should transfer really well. In fact, the techniques, the composing techniques I teach, uh, can be applied to all medium. So it's not, it's not just oil. I'm not an oil painter. I'm a painter who happens to use oil to teach with. Let me add this, that back in the 60s when I was in school, as an art student, we were required to use acrylics because in those days they thought that uh, oils were going to go out of, just going to be antiquated. The oils would fade away and acrylics would be the medium of the painter. It didn't happen that way, did it? But because of that, they required that we use acrylics. And I decided that after I had graduated and then started in graduate school where I, it didn't matter which medium I used, I decided that I really loved oil best. So that's the answer to the question. Well, back in the 60s, I was finger painting because I was in <laughs> elementary school. Well, you were just learning then. <laughs> I was, I was, and I'm still learning. Tells you how, who's the oldest, but don't I look the youngest? Absolutely. <laughs> Our next question, what do you use for drawing on your canvas? Mm, mm, okay. Uh, it depends on the size of the canvas. If it's a smaller canvas or if I'm demonstrating for you, my, many times I will use the Tombow pen. That's a water-soluble pen. It's a pen on one end and a brush on the other. And the reason I do is that it is water-soluble. And so if I need to edit the drawing, uh, then I just wet a little Q-tip and pull that out and edit it. Uh, when I'm Sometimes in the quick tips, and if so, of course in some of the, the courses and lessons, uh, I will be using a wash uh, with a brush. And the reason I do that is it flows much more quickly. The drawing flows much more quickly. When I say wash, I mean a little bit of paint that is thinned down with a little bit of Gamsol. Now, you don't want to add Gamsol to the paint in later stages, but it works just well for the canvas. What I do not use is charcoal. Uh, I know some artists do, but to me, charcoal smears, and it just makes the canvas appear sort of dirty. And I know that also there are artists who use charcoal on their canvas, and they'll do put fixative on it. I, I just don't think that's a good idea. So for me, 
I think it's wiser to use um, either a water soluble pen or a brush that's used in the wash made from uh, oil paint and Gamsol. Okay. That's a great tip. A lot of people have that question. Uh, and that what, what Dan uses is the Tombow. It's T O M. B O W. B O W. And if you look on Amazon or one of your art supply websites or in the store, you'll also find one that's a combo pen, C O M B O. And uh, so there are subtle differences in that. And uh, you can pick out what you like. Absolutely. Might add to that too. The Tombow, T-O-M-B-O-W, has a whole range of shades of, of black, then to shades of gray, and on to uh, practically nothing. So you have some choices there. If you don't like the black line, then go with a shade of gray. Thank you so much, Diane. Welcome. Uh, not exactly I don't know for what, what, yet, what but reference welcome. to, but... <laughs> Maybe we'll find out here. Mm -hmm. oh. Do you have a Patreon page where we can support these videos and your wonderful teaching? Wow. Yeah. Well, that one did a little bit of a head swell. Uh, we do not have a Patreon page. The reason we do not is we already have too much already to keep up with. We have the the uh, lessons website, which is dianemice.com. We have the courses website, which is our academy. It's .com. We have the YouTube quick tips. And we also have the newsletters that we send out. So one more thing would just be one more place that you would have to go. So we have decided against any kind of, of a Patreon or any of those other um, cluster areas where you can find teachers. But you can support us if you want to. And the best way is to become a YouTube subscri a member. Member. Uh, many of you have already been subscribe are already subscribers, but if you become a member or a channel member, now this is not member of the website, uh, either of the websites. This is a YouTube channel member. It, it's only four ninety nine a month, and what you get for that is you can uh, tune in every third Sunday, or sometimes it's a fourth Sunday, when we have our live chats, and you can ask questions there. What and the other thing, uh, two other things you get. You get a free lesson every month, a free lesson from the lessons website every month, as long as you remember. And then you'll also get every second Sunday, you'll get a little, a little tip, a little video, a uh, little clip from a video lesson that's a, a tip about uh, composing or techniques, various sorts of things. Did I cover everything? Uh, oh. Yes. You can hit the join button and uh, that's how you become a member. Or the super chat, and then there's also super chat mm -hmm. uh, during the live broadcast, and there are YouTube offers a couple of different ways that you can donate to the channel itself we'll if mind, so inclined. We won't mind the donation or two you know, every now it, and then. Uh, it helps us keep the equipment up and running, and uh, may also be able to buy some paint. How about that? Okay, what's next? Okay, the next question. Why shouldn't we use liquid as a final coat or glaze? Well, well, well. Okay, first of all, let's clear up some nomenclature. Um, I think, I know the person means varnish. The final coat will always be the varnish because a glaze is a method we use in painting when we paint in layers. And what was that final coat? We don't really use the word coat in our painting nomenclature because it implies, you know, just a, a flat coat of paint. Uh, uh, it may be used in just when people are like toning their canvases or whatever, but the terms we use refer to techniques that we use in the painting itself. All right, liquid. Liquid is made for a single purpose, and that is to facilitate faster drying of oil paint. When liquid dries, it's there forever. It's no way that you can uh, go back into it and dissolve it. The purpose of a varnish, a final varnish over a painting, is to protect the painting. Just like we use glass, that's, that's for oil paint, of course. 
just like we use glass for protecting watercolors and pastels. And uh, because it's, a, it's that coat there, just like glass is going to get dirty, you know if you hang a painting in your house and you put glass on it, uh, Lord knows how, but that's, it will get dirty. And, and over time, it will begin to kind of fog up and kind of dull the painting. You know, and you can take some Windex, that's not a commercial. I should say glass cleaner, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. But take a glass Windex cleaner. Windex could support us <laughs> if they wanted to. I wouldn't mind. But anyway, <laughs> and with a watercolor or pastel and the glass, you can just clean it. You're done. Not with oil. With oils, we use that final coat of varnish that is specially formulated to go on the oil paint. It is dissolvable after it dries. And so after a period of time, if the stuff happens to the, the oil painting that happens to the watercolor and cause it to get dull, dirty, some used to be fly specks and stuff like that, better not go there. But anyway, uh, you can take any kind of mineral spirits or turpentine. Usually these days we like to use those refined mineral spirits. And I prefer Gamsol for this because it is the best, in my opinion, of the mineral spirits, the solvents that we have. But you can take that solvent, and there are many instructions on YouTube as to how to remove that varnish. But that varnish can be removed with the solvent, and then the residue can be lifted out with alcohol and a lint-free lint pad, and a new coat of gar a new coat of varnish uh, put on the painting. And and so the the reason you can see now, if you use liquid for that final coat, and it gets real real uh, grimy and dirty, what are you going to do? You might try cleaning that, then you're going to dull the surface of it because any kind of solvent or whatever you'd use to clean that will most likely cause the liquid itself to get dull. And so that's the reason we don't use liquid as our final varnish. And one of the things I've learned from you in the past was that oil paint does not evaporate. Oh, that's right. And before you apply any glazing or finishes, you want to make sure your paint is absolutely dry. Absolutely dry. And there's another reason I forgot to mention that you don't use liquid as final varnish because uh, if you you know because oil paint uh, oxidizes instead of evaporates, it the drying will happen from the surface of the oil painting backwards. And so if the paint in in the over if the paint touching the the canvas itself or any any part of that is still damp, not quite dried yet, you put that liquid over it, as that dries, it's gonna cause your painting to crack. The paint on your painting to crack. So yeah, that's another reason. Glad you thought of that one. All right. Yeah. I'm I'm learning a little bit. Doing well. I always said I would become the accidental painter. Hasn't <laughs> happened yet. Right, but uh, I believe you could. After over ten years and you now five hundred quick tips and four hundred and some full lessons, <laughs> I've, I've picked up some stuff. It's <laughs> actually helped me in my photography and videography. See, so uh, it's a lot of tools you can learn here. Oh yeah. Okay, the next question. Is using poppy oil okay instead of linseed oil? Probably not. The reason is poppy oil is a slow drying oil and linseed oil is a faster drying oil. Another good reason too is that the, the consistency of the drying, we explained that in the previous question, but if you use poppy oil, the paint itself is made of linseed oils. There are some paints that are made of, of other oils too. But the poppy oil, if you, if you use poppy oil to thin certain, you probably won't be thinning all of your paints. Uh, you, you'll develop an inconsistency in the drying process because it evaporates. The poppy oil is so much slower in drying that the paint might crack. Uh, the paint that doesn't have as much poppy oil or none in it that's on your painting. And then those areas that do have the poppy oil going to dry at a different rate, different speed, and then therefore you may get cracking in your paint. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's preferable uh, to, to use just the linseed oil within, if you've got to thin the paint, and sometimes it comes out of the tube. If the tube's been sitting for quite a while, oil settles down, settles out of the pigment that's in the tube, it becomes stiff. 
and we need a creamy consistency for painting with oil paint. So therefore we need to add back just a drop or two of linseed oil and mix it in really thoroughly to get that consistency back. So linseed oil is a better one for that one than poppy oil. Poppy oil does serve other purposes in painting, like uh, a little bit of poppy oil rub, rubbed onto the canvas to reduce the tension of the surface and then wipe down. There's not enough there to cause a problem. And so uh, that's a good use for it, but um, not, not as a replacement. All right, thank you. Our next question. How do you stop the paint drying <laughs> from drying hard on your palette? I see you have a lot mixed, ready to use. Oh, well, this question comes up quite a bit. Yeah, and the reason it comes up is because on my palette, the, the colors are piled on the edge of the palette all the way around, big piles of color. Well, uh, I got that idea from Richard Schmidt. I've always arranged my colors and made the selection of my colors uh, according to the color wheel. I aligned them on the palette according to the sequence of their hues in the color wheel. And uh, uh, I also love painting in watercolor. Now in watercolor, we squeeze out the entire tube of paint or a good bit of the tube of paint into the little individual wells and we can reconstitute re, uh, it every time with a little water. Oh, it can't be reconstituted. But I painting with watercolor so much, I'm used to those colors around. They, just, they act as little stimulus, having those colors around me while I'm working. And that's why I loved that idea when I first saw Richard Schmidt did it. I loved that idea so much I decided that's a good idea to have my colors right there, the, the colors I use most, tube colors, and have them right there handy so I can see everything. And glance my eyes down and it just feels like a I candy to me. So, that, but there's another thing too. Oh, by the way, and that stuff does dry. There's a little dry piles on my palette. They're made in, uh, they have accumulated over the years, paint left over from painting sessions. I just leave it there instead of trying to save it because sometimes it doesn't, uh, doesn't work well to try to save it. Uh, so anyway, that's accumulation over the years and it's been many, many years accumulating. Every now and then I have to, Cut some of that stuff down because the piles get big, built uh, too big. It's simply for me to have the colors there. Now, there's another part I need to answer to this question. When we're in the process of oil painting, uh, if we're doing a large painting that can't be completed in one session, or give me a small painting can't be completed in one session, uh, and you already have your colors mixed on your palette, uh, what can we do to keep them moist and workable so that they'll be ready for us when we come back the next day. I have a solution that I've tried many, many things over the years, and I know there are those palettes that have the, the tops. They don't work that well. A lot of people will stick their palette in the freezer. That doesn't appeal to me. And sometimes I don't have room in my freezer for that palette anyway. But I know I don't know. It's just aesthetically unappealing to me to stick a, my, my palette in the freezer. And don't ask me why. But anyway, this is me talking. Uh, what I found that works really, really well is I keep a, these, these little fine mist bottles like this. You can get these on Amazon. You can buy a half dozen or a dozen at a time, not very expensive. Maybe drugstores, I think, might have them fine mist now, not those, uh, not those that have the sprinkled kind of mist, but the really fine mist. Uh, uh, any, you know, novelty stores, I don't know where else, uh, Walmart for sure. You can get those. And I just buy them by the dozen. And I create a mixture, and this is where poppy oil does come, come in handy. I create a mixture of 50% poppy oil, 50% gamsol. Remember, gamsol is a solvent. And then at the end of a, a session, painting session at the end of the day, I do two things. I lightly spray the whole area of the palette with this fine mist, lightly. And I hold it about this distance right here from the palette and spray it lightly. Then I tear, I put a piece of plastic wrap. I'm going to say surround wrap because it's what we used to call it, but you know, the wrap we use to wrap food with. I keep a roll of that in the studio all the time, and I just pull a piece of that out, and I lay it down over that layer. Then I take my, my hands, and I smooth out all the little bubbles because the bubbles that that wrap creates on top of the uh, surface there is oxygen. We don't want oxygen to hit our paints. 
If, if you do that and then seal it with your hand really good around, you'll be surprised that when you come back to it the next day, you're ready to go. We have a quick tip about that as well. Oh, we do? Good. Which one? Do you know which one? I believe it's Quick Tip 172. Oh, it's in there too. Quick I Tip 172. So. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's called Paint Palette and Palette Paint. Good. Which goes both approaches it's there. Both, I think both approaches. And uh, yeah, it's uh, excluding the oxygen to keep the oil paint from oxidizing. Right. That's it. And uh, I'm sure it works for other things as well. Uh, it, it would help with acrylics. Oh, well, yeah, it, but you wouldn't want to use the poppy seed oil mixture. Yeah, use no. water. Uh, if, uh, if you're using that method for acrylics, uh, you, uh, acrylics do evaporate, I think. I'm pretty sure they do evaporate. Uh, but if you use a fine mist spray of water and then and then lay the, the plastic wrap over it, it should keep that acrylic. If you seal out the oxygen, that's the key. All right. The color you chose to outline and place shadows. Mm. I'm not sure which uh, quick tip it was I think that was about no tan, one of the no tan quick tips. Oh, okay. I think that was a response to that. Is that because the picture was already cool? Uh, I guess they're referring to the reference picture. I think they were. Uh -huh. uh, is this how you choose to outline color and color of canvas? Okay, that's a good question. Um, first of all, again, let me clear up some nomenclature. Outline is, uh, I, I would like for you to replace that word outline with preliminary drawing because we're not just outlining a shape, but what we're doing is we're looking at a shape and we're discovering the various uh, angles or shape, various angles or curves and the way they're going uh, to create a drawing of that shape. So outlining simply kind of, it suggests, uh, you know, just an outline of an edge like that. And you're doing a lot more than that when you're setting up, when you're placing your images on your painting. You're placing them according to uh, how those images relate to each other and how they relate to the edge of the painting. So I wouldn't use that term outline. All right, so now that we've got that. The other question, uh, that particular quick tip, and I can't remember which one it was, was about or had something to do with my with use how I use no tan. Now, no tan is a design that that a pattern. Let's say no tan is a pattern that places uh, where all the shadows are going to go, or where you see all the shadows in your reference, and where there is no shadow, which is light. That's all the no tan does. And that's what this person is referring to, I think. And they're asking why I used gray. Was that it? Uh, One. Did... No, which. Oh, is that what the color you choose to. Uh, yeah, I probably was. He, he's, the person said the color you choose to. Uh, I probably was using. Uh, I, I could have been using this the Tombo or I could have been using. Uh, but anyway. The color I use for the no tan ne does not necessarily relate to the colors that I'm using in the scene. I'm simply trying to plot the shadow, the shadow, and the light on, with no tan. And I usually use something very uh, neutral or close to neutral. A lot of times I will use uh, a very thin wash of ultramarine blue uh, because it it doesn't have it's not staining. And it's um, not imposing. It won't bleed through the other colors. Uh, that's um, when I'm working, especially when I'm working large on the canvas. And in the past, I've used a burnt umber for that a lot just because it's so neutral. But uh, I, I don't choose a color that is related to the color's choice I'm going to make in the canvas because what I do there is not going to show through. And the, the way I paint what I do there is not going to show through. I know a lot of people tone their canvases. I've always found that uh, I don't relate to toning the canvas. And so I'm one of those people who does not tone the canvas. But when people tone the canvas, they'll make the selection of the colors they use for toning according to the, the whether they want a warm or cool painting. Now, sometimes they'll they choose a warm color to tone with and they'll choose cool colors to paint with and a little bit of that warm tone might come through and, and cause a nice little 
Christmas in color there. And sometimes people choose a color that, uh, like a temperature of color or color choices, uh, from the subject itself. So if it's a subject of a cool landscape, they might use a cooler color to, 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 to tone the canvas. But, uh, since my method does not use a toned canvas, I'm only concerned with plotting that pattern of where the light and shadow goes, uh, and when I'm, when I'm creating that no tan. Uh, mm -hmm. that be that clear? I think so. And, uh, but. I do believe we have some quick tips on oh. toning oh. the canvas. And uh, like all of the quick tips, I see them as tools in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. You can use what you like and disregard what you don't like. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, about composition primarily, but it has a lot of technical skills that you can use. Sure. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, these quick tips, I always try to, to make them short enough so that it's not going to bore you. I would always try to limit it to one thing. And I try to present something that you can practice yourself. Something that I can show you a way to practice something, whether it's uh, something that has to do with the way a painting is composed, or if it's something technical about materials or tools that we use. Dear Diane, can you compile all your quick tips into a book, please? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be an excellent reference book for artists. Well, let's think about it now. We've got 500 quick tips now. Probably going to keep doing them until we both drop, right? Maybe. Yeah, probably Perhaps. so. It's possible to get 500 more. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen how thick a book is that has 500 pages in it? <clears throat> because... If we if we did that, so that's a it's, it's a I love the suggestion. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, but if you think about it, every quick tip would require at least one page. And if you think about the illustrations that we would need to put in there, it would require maybe three or four pages. Well, so if every quick tip required one page, that's a book that's about mm, like that, maybe something like depending on the thickness of the paper. All right. So then if we added another page from the illustration. It gets about that thick. <laughs> uh, if we add yeah. a third page, well, you, you're looking at about like dictionary, right? Uh, I don't think I can do that in one lifetime. <laughs> Let's just uh, maybe maybe after uh, I'm uh, maybe after I escape from this earth, my my nephews will decide that would be a good project. <laughs> <laughs> now there are some books by Diane right. that uh, dwell on a lot of these aspects. Well, there's the finding freedom to create, which is kind of, uh, it's, it's about freeing yourself, using the composing principles to free yourself into painting rather than trying to memorize rules that are going to con con contract your efforts in painting. And then the little, um, uh, I'm, I'm working on one right now. It's going to be out, I hope, by the end of the year, certainly, about the whole principle of light and shadow. Uh, how we work, how we can use that no tan to, to, uh, give us a freedom again for interpreting light and shadow in a way that gives us a dynamic painting. So that's in the works right now. And I'm hoping by the end of this year's, this is, by the way, for people looking at this for five years from now, 2024. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right now it's September, right? It is. September 2024. Okay. So if you're working, if you're watching this five years from now, check it out. There'll probably be a no tan book and another one or two later on. Maybe. No, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure at all. <laughs> Our last question ah. is this might be a simplistic question. Nah. But what? But but I would very <laughs> much like an answer. All right. Let's see what we do. It's a little demanding there, but it's all right. That's why we're here. On that's your why knees, we have, right? <laughs> that's why we have subscribers. Absolutely. Because we get the questions and see what we can do about getting them answered. Absolutely. Is it considered acceptable oh. to leave some parts of the canvas exposed, in example, not painted in oil painting? I know in watercolor it is encouraged, but what of oils? Okay, uh, two part question there, right? Let's, let's address, address the last one first. I want to it, clear up something here. It's not just that it was, it was it's encouraged in, not just that it's encouraged in watercolor. In watercolor, 
the white paper is your white paint. And so the more of the white paper, when, when you're painting uh, something that's got lots of light in it, there's going to be some of that white paper coming through because that is your light, that is your white. In watercolor, that's not true in oil. Now, in oil painting, we have some technical, well, both of them have some technical considerations, uh, but in oil painting, we have a technical consideration. And I'm not so sure this is, I'm not so sure the same thing is true in acrylic. Remember I talked about how oil oxidizes and, and where if the paint underneath an oxidate, an oxidated surface, oxidated drier surface, <laughs> you know, if the paint underneath there is least bit damp or whatever, uh, and then if there are layers beside it that are already dry, it has a tendency, to, this paint as it does, it shrinks and pulls away. So also that when you do an oil painting, you have formed a, thi a, a, lay a, a film, a film, that's the word I'm looking for. You formed a film of paint over the surface of that canvas. If that, if there are areas that are empty, then you've created kind of inconsistency. There's nothing for that film to grab to. So what you're creating is you're creating a film of paint and you want, you want the paint to go over the whole, whole surface. Don't leave that canvas empty because if you do, it's possible as your paint dries, it could start cracking or other things could happen to it. Um, and, and also there's another part of that. And that is that, uh, when you varnish that area, because it's just that canvas showing coming through the varnish, uh, it's, it's not going to have the same surface quality. And, and the varnish even probably would cause that to yellow and uh, be really kind of ugly. Nosty, so nasty. <laughs> nasty, 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 <laughs> nasty. But just, just don't do it. It's not a good technical practice. Is that all it? right, that is all the questions we have right now. We hope you uh, enjoyed this and uh, hopefully stayed with us. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> and keep those questions. We base all our quick tips on the questions you ask in the comment section. Comment section is right there. You don't have to make it really fancy. Just ask the question because I'm going to answer every single comment you put down there. And if you ask a question, we'll do a quick tip. And we do appreciate just the shout outs and uh, people appreciating what we do and the amount of work and time we put into this and happy painting happy painting and look for the next 500 <laughs> be sure to view all of our quick tips and while you're doing so subscribe to the channel click on the bell so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip which is every week and if you have a question leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you also take a trip over to dyingmize.com where I have full length lessons downloads, DVDs, lots of other stuff there, some free stuff for you. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter, and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new. All right, which one are we going to choose? Uh, well, we have to keep practicing.